tardes y ya para, ir a, para terminar este, este acto, este homenaje a Susan Hack de forma eh, ya apresurada por estos reportes que hemos necesitado hacer y estos ajustes, vamos a terminar con, con eh, la entrega del, del premio a la profesora del Premio Internacional de Cultura Jurídica 2020 a la profesora Susan Hack. Eh, previo a la entrega formal del premio, eh, pedimos al eh, profesor José Juan Moreso que eh, si tenía bien hacer el discurso de laudatio de, de la profesora Hack, eh, así tuvo a bien hacerlo y, y, y ahora nosotros tendremos a bien escucharlo. Así que, tus. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I would like to say. Uh, first of all, that I guess that this is today the only the only international academic workshop in the world. <laughs> in the world because this is the problem, the only, only academic workshop. And uh, this is for the following reason. This is for the the incredible, the incredible persistence of Jordi Ferrer and the incredible courage of Professor Susan. Thank you very much. I am, I am very honored and grateful for the invitation of Legal Cultural Chair, Cátedra de Cultura Jurídica, and in a special way to its director and beloved friend, Professor Jordi Ferrer, to give the deserved laudatio, laudatio for Professor Susan Hack. Here in Girona, it is not easy to praise conveniently her trajectory, Most of you know better than me the relevance of her philosophical contributions, particularly her crucial contribution to the epistemology of evidence in law. Professor Susan Hack is one of the so-called Osbridge academics, perhaps the most distinguished university education in our world. She earned the Bachelor and Master of Arts at Oxford University in the program on philosophy, politics, and economics, and after philosophy, and the PhD at Cambridge University. In her English Wikipedia page, it is said that her first philosopher teacher was Jen Austen, the widow of the great Oxford philosopher, uh, Professor J. L. Austen. Well, I would wish to begin uh, with a, pro a personal anecdote. In 1995, I was in a research stay in Oxford, at Oxford, and one day in a second-hand workshop uh, near to the bus station in Oxford, I found a copy of one important legal book of the great Argentinian philosopher and lawyer, Professor Genaro Carrió, who was also the first Chief Justice of the Argentinian Supreme Court after the military dictatorship in the presidency of Raúl Alfonsín. The book has the title Recurso Extraordinario por Sentencia Arbitraria, something like a special review grounded on arbitrary judgment, published in 1967. I opened the book and founded the following dedication. The following dedication. To Mrs. Jane Austen, the author respectfully offers this book, which borrows freely from uh, and perhaps exemplifies Professor Austen's doctrine concerning the infelicities of speech acts. <coughs> Genaro Carrió, Oxford, May 1967. And obviously, I decided to buy, to buy it for only three pounds. Note that Professor Carrió wrote uh, mistakenly the first name of Miss Austin. He wrote uh, Jane in, in, the, in, the, in the following way, J-A-N-E. But in fact, her name was J-E-A-N. Perhaps Professor Carrió was thinking on the name of the great English novelist Jane Austen. In 
who might know, perhaps again, Professor Austin decided the name of his book, Sense and Sensibilia, published post postmostly in 1962, thinking on, the, on his wife and naturally in Sense and Sensibility of the marvelous writer of Hampshire. Well, in this laudatio, I shall attempt to say some orthogonal thoughts to the three major contributions of Professor Hack. Firstly, her contribution to the philosophy of logic. Secondly, her original epistemological account called Fundamentalism. And finally, her philosophical considerations about the place of evidence in law. In fact, her contributions to the philosophy of logic were written when Professor Hack was very young. Three, uh, there are Debian Logic, 74, and Philosophy of Logic, 78. Several generations of scholars learned a great deal with these books, I myself included. For instance, we learn to distinguish when logic is only an extension of classical logic and when Debian Logic is, for saying it with Quine, only changing the subject even though Quine may be considered that always deviant logic is changing the subject. As it is well known, Quine wrote, here evidently is the deviant logician predicament. When he tries to deny the, doc the doctrine, he only changed the subject. As Hack convincingly argues, for instance, modal logic or the hunting logic can be considered acceptable extensions of uh, classical logic. Nevertheless, logics rejecting the law of non-contradiction probably are changing the subject, or at least it's my opinion. 30 years on, Professor Hack discussed in the journal Ratio Juris about the relevance and applicability of logic to law and to legal doctrine. In her paper on the logic in the law, something but not all, in Ratio Juris in 2007, uh, in this paper, Professor Hack strongly criticizes the legal doctrine understood as logical theology in the way of the first dean of, the first dean of Harvard Law School, Christopher Columbus Langdell. No, uh, normative Systems, 71, 1971, by Carlos Alchurron and Eugenio Bulligin, is put in the same path of Langdell's theology and, as it, subject, subjected to the famous criticism of Oliver Wendell Holmes. <coughs> the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. It is no surprising, then, that Eugenio Bulligin replied in the same journal next year. The, the, the paper is uh, titled, What can one expect from logic in the law? Not every, everything, but more than something, a, repli a reply to Susan Hack. Really, I think that this is a, a French dispute with only difference of the day. Nevertheless, and this is the opinion also of Mufato Nicola this morning, nevertheless, I would like to emphasize here an idea included in the book Philosophy of Logics and very relevant to an important debate in legal theory. I shall consider the question whether the amendment constitutional clauses can be used to amend themselves. In uh, 1972, in the prestigious journal Mind, the important philosopher, legal philosopher, a professor of Ross, published a paper on self-reference and a puzzle in constitutional law, defending that amending constitutional clauses cannot be applied to themselves. The alleged reason was the position of Jorgen Jorgensen, who advocated before also in mind some reflections on reflecti reflexivity, wrote, the most important generalization than, that can, ban, can be made uh, from these considerations is, to my, man, to my mind, that no, no sentence can, ref can refer to itself, or that no sentences no sentences are self-referring. Several important legal philosophers, among them Herbert Hart, Norbert Hester, Joseph Rush, 
and in Latin countries, Eugenio Bulin, Ricardo Dibur, Carlos Lino, for instance, even I myself published a paper on these Jews. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in these important contributions, there is not in a clear way the understanding of the fact that there are self-referring sentences which produce no paradox, and there are paradoxes produced without self-reference. The crucial idea, in my view, is presented by Professor Hack in Philosophy of, Lo Philosophy of Logic, says uh, Professor Hack. It's sometimes suggested that the paradoxes be resolved by finding self-reference, but this suggestion is at once too broad and too narrow. It falls full of the don't cut off your nose to spite your face, to spite your face principle. For not only are many perfectly harmless sentences, these sentences in English, these sentences in, in self-referential, but also some mathematical argument, including Gödel's proof of the incompleteness of arithmetic, makes essential use of self-referential sentences. So that the consequences of a ban on self-reference would be very serious. And yet, since not all the variants of the liar are straightforwardly self-referential, neither sentence in the next sentence is false, the previous sentence is true, <coughs> sorry, refers to itself. This proposal is, at, this, at the same time, uh, too narrow. In my view, this is the clue to solve uh, the puzzle of constitutional amendment, and recent constitutions adopted this solution, making explicit that they refer to themselves. For instance, the Constitution of Canada, when it refers to the most protected parts of the Constitution in the section 41, establishes an, an amendment to the Constitution of Canada in relation to the following matters may be made by proclamation used by the Governor General under the Great Seal of Canada only where, where, uh, where authorized by resolutions of the Senate and House of Commons and of the Legislative Assembly of each province. And say five possibilities. A, the office of the Queen, the Governor General, and the leader and governor of a province. B, the right of a province to a number of members in the House of Commons, not less than, than the number of senators by which the province is entitled to be represented at the time this part comes in force, into force, Constitution Act 1982. Uh, subject to Section 43, the use of English or the French language, D, the composition of the Supreme Court of Canada, and E, this is the important question, an amendment to this part. And the Constitution of South Africa, at the beginning of the section 74 states, bills amending the Constitution. One, section one and this subsection may be amended by a bill passed by a, the National Assembly, with supporting vote uh, of at least 75% uh, of its members, and B, the National Council of Provinces, with a supporting vote of less six provinces. And I mean, in my view, this strategy makes sense. An elegant and accurate constitutional drafting solves the problem. Also, in, the, in these cases, self-reference is innocuous and safe. As it is, extending the examples of Professor Hart to imperative sentence, the order, the order read the sentence aloud is self-referential and not problematic. The, the, second period, the second period, after moving from Cambridge to the University of Warwick and after to the Miami University, constitutes probably the most perdurable contribution to the philosophy uh, of Professor Hack. The doctrine of epistemology known as Fonderentis, contained in the book Evidence and Inquiry Towards Reconstruction in Epistemology in 1993. In an interview published in China, the Journal of World Philosophy in 2003, she explained her position in this nice way. 
The book is devoted to the articulation and defense of my new theory of epistemic justification, which I call Founderentism, because it combines elements from the traditional rival theories, foundationalism, and coherentism. I argue, however, that foundationalism and coherentism don't exhaust the field, and that an intermediate theory is more plausible than either. It is po possible to allow the <coughs> <coughs> the relevance of experience to the justification of empirical beliefs, as experientialist foundationalism does, but coherentism does not. And at the same time, instead, instead of requiring privileged class, class of basic beliefs to allow for pervasive mutual dependence among belief, as coherentism does, but foundationalism does not. This is our, these are the key ideas of fundamentalism. The crossword analogy, by the way, first came, first came to mind as a way of understanding how there can be mutual support among beliefs, as the, there is mutual support among crossword entries without vicious circularity. And then I realized that the analogy helped with another problem too, that the clues to a crossword where the analog of a person's spiritual evidence and already completed intersecting entries, the analog of his reason for a belief. Not being an epi epistemologist, I only want to note that some years before the book of Professor Hack, R. Sosa published a paper, The Rough and the Pyramid, Coherence versus Foundations in the Theory of Knowledge, uh, and in this paper, Sosa begins with the same pre problem of Professor Hack, and he intends also to make compatible foundationalism and coherentism. His publication is considered the birth of the so-called virtue epistemology, which now counts on a lot of followers, books, and papers. It seems to me that Professor Hack dislikes virtue epistemology, considering Sosa's view a special kind, only a special kind of re reliabilism and she praises the philosophical, well-founded uh, well analysis of virtues in the book of uh, Linda Saxesby, The Virtues of Mind. Be that as it may, foundationalism is, without any doubt, a precious and illuminating exemplar of original, brilliant, and fruitful philosophical account. Well, a kid with logic and epistemology, it is not surprising that Professor Hack put her eyes in the law of evidence. In fact, the Monday, the Monday of this week, coming back, back, coming back from Bolivia, I have found an, in my office the recently published Spanish book of Professor Hack. This book presented <coughs> before, introduced before. Filosofía del Derecho y de la Prueba, Perspectivas Pragmatistas. Most of them, most of, of, of the papers included in this, in this book, included in the English book, English book, sorry, Evidence Matters, Science, Proof, and Truth in the Law, which contains the main contributions to this field of evidence in the last 15 years. I would like to highlight two different aspects of this Spanish publication. On the one hand, and as, as far as I can see in such short space of time, the translation of Dr. Carmen Vázquez is really excellent, and it is important to a foreign author be well translated in order to be adequately, uh, adequately understood. On the other hand, the subtitle of the book is very convenient, Pragmatist Perspective. As it is well known, Professor Hack feels herself in the path of William James and Charles Sanders Peirce, the most original American contribution to the contemporary philosophy. Moreover, in uh, uh, 1872, both philosophers with Oliver Wendell Holmes, the judge of the Supreme Court, perhaps the most relevant judge in the history of the court, formed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the so-called the Metaphysical Club, and Holmes is other of the giants in the Hackian work. At the beginning of Evidence Matters, Professor Hack introduces very well 
her questions and her aims in this field. So relevant to legal theory in this way. It's true in the law just plain truth, or it's something sui generis? It's a trial, a search for truth, or is it something more or something less than that? Do the adversarial procedures of common law systems promote factually sound verdicts? Do legal rules excluding relevant testimony enable, to enable the accurate determination of factual issues? or impede it? What bearing, if any, does the mathematical calculus of probabilities have on the degrees and standards of proof, in legal, uh, of proof involved in the law? What role can stat statistical evidence appropriately play in legal proof? How do the argument and counter-argument of adversarial proceedings differ from what scientists do as they seek out seek out, sift, and weigh evidence? How can courts best handle the scientific testimony on which they now so often rely? And how are they to distinguish genuine science from pretenders or reliable scientific testi testimony from unreliable hokum? The dozen interdisciplinary essays collected here take up a whole nexus for, of such questions about science, proof, and truth in the law, bringing my work in epistemology and philosophy of science, and from time to time, my work in philosophy of logic and language, metaphysics, etc., to bear both on general questions about legal standards of proof and the relative merits of common law and civil law approaches to the handling of evidence, and on scientific questions about the role of scientific testimony in legal proceedings. A key theme of my epistemology is that the structure of evidence can be understood by analogy, again, with a crossword puzzle. And just as this would lead you to expect the arguments of this essay ramify, interlock, and loop up and back. I am going, going to finish this action with an argument in order to show in accordance with Professor Hack and Professor Wright, with the same example, the limited place of calculus of probability in law. Let me suppose that we can consider private law uh, that a certain proposition P is considered as proof when the probability of P is greater than uh, 0.5. Now we have two propositions, two independent propositions, referred to independent events, P and Q, with a probability of uh, 0.6 each one. Then we have that, given their probability is greater than 0.5, it is proved that P and it is proved than Q. And if something of the principle of agglomeration is accepted here, it, it is dif difficult to reject in my view, then we get that the conjunction proposition P and Q is proved to. Nevertheless, the conjunct probability of P and, and Q is the result of multiplying the probabilities of both propositions. That is to say, 0.6 multiplied 4.6 this equal uh, 0.36, that is less than 0.5. Therefore, P, P and Q is not proved. This is a contradiction, and in my view, a good reason for not accepting the straightforward application to the calculus of probabilities to the legal evidence. And now I finish reminding a sentence of a Latin writer, Publius Cyrus. Publius Cyrus wrote, Publius Cyrus wrote, Benefic Beneficium dando a capit we did not dead it. In English, something like honoring someone who deserves it is like doing a favor for yourself. Good evening and thanks a lot. Muchas gracias, José Juan. Dado que la relación con Susan Hack eh, eh, 
entre Girona y Susan Hart nació eh, a partir de la aceptación como eh, tutorizada de Carmen Vázquez y dado que Carmen Vázquez fue también quien eh, primero invitó a, Carmen, a, a Susan Hart a Girona y dado que Carmen Vázquez es también la traductora de la, del libro que hemos publicado hoy, le pido a Carmen que se acerque para el premio del Premio Internacional de Cultura Jurídica 2020 a su hija. Gracias.